World War II draws to an end. The atomic bomb unleashed. The sprint for the secret of the atom is over. Now, scientists all over the world are racing to discover the key to life, the secret of DNA. May 1st, 1952. A female scientist, one of the few in her university, is clicking off the final hours of her X-ray developed image that has taken over 100 hours of exposure to bring her to this moment. Little she knows that it would soon become the door into the mystery all have been trying so hard to solve. This is the secret of Photograph 51, the key to DNA, the turning point in the study of life. In 1866, a monk named Gregor Mendel came to the realization that genes came in pairs, one from each parent, containing the traits that would map out the offspring. His work was one of the very first pivots in the study of molecular biology, followed by Friedrich Menscher's experiments. Menscher's work is considered the first rough extraction of DNA, although he called it nuclein at the time, as it resided in the nucleus of cells. In 1919, Phobius Levine identified the base, the phosphate, and the sugar unit in DNA. Scientists were just beginning to realize that the secret of the genome was held not in protein, but in these little strands of DNA. A genome is a series of all the nucleotides in order. Why is the human genome so important then? Decoding the human genome is used today to cure thousands of diseases, using the information from the DNA to treat and prevent them. But in the 1950s, at the time of Francis Crick and James Watson, the study of molecular biology was still in its youth. Without knowledge of the structure of DNA, they could not decode the genome. James Watson had always been fascinated with science. One of his favorite words was why. As a child, he won $100 as a quiz kid, then bought binoculars for bird watching with that money. At 15 years old, he entered the University of Chicago under the Gifted Youth Program. In his senior year, Watson read Schrodinger's book, What is Life? The Physical Aspect of the Living Cell, and was introduced to the idea of chromosomes and genes for the first time. In 1950, he got his PhD and later landed at the University of Cambridge, sharing an office with a PhD student named Francis Crick. Crick had also always been a curious child. He read every encyclopedia he could find and did small kitchen science experiments in his home. He later began to get a second-class honors degree in physics at the University College, London. While doing graduate research, he taught himself the rudiments of quantum mechanics when World War II came into his life. Throughout the war, he worked for the Admiralty doing research and design on mines and weapons. After the war ended, he finally decided to enter the study of life and entered Cambridge in 1947. On meeting, Crick and Watson hit it off immediately. From an early age, Franklin was the sort of person who excelled at everything. One of her closest friends, Ann Piper, recalls, She was one of those very able people of great sensitivity who tend to mask their shyness with a brusque, abrupt ma manner. She never suffered fools gladly. Her mother noted, Rosalind knew exactly where she was going, and at 16, she took science for her subject. In 1938, 16-year-old Franklin left St. Paul's School to join Newham College, one of the two women's colleges at Cambridge University. Her father, Ellis Franklin, attempted to persuade her to take a more traditional course, but her mother and aunt sided with Rosalind until Ellis agreed. At the university, she majored in physical chemistry. World War II affected her education. Many professors left for war work. Some of the faculty was held as aliens. In one letter, Franklin wrote, Practically the whole of the Cavendish laboratory have disappeared. Biochemistry was almost entirely run by Germans and may not survive. Several war refugees arrived at Cambridge, such as French scientist Adrien Weil, a former student of Marie Curie's and Franklin's mentor and friend. Franklin continued to learn and re receive scholarships and research grants, traveling from Cambridge to France focusing on coals, carbons, and x-ray crystallography. Her experience would soon pay, play into her life when in 1950, she found a position in King's College, England to study the newly developing science of DNA. However, John Randall, the director of the lab, had written to her, this means that as far as the experimental x-ray effort is concerned, there will be at the moment only herself and Gosling. What was not specified was that Maurice Wilkins, her equal in the lab, 
was only gone on a trip when Franklin came to stay at the college. When he returned, he found a lob that was no longer his own. His former PhD student, Raymond Gosling, had been put under Franklin's supervision. More than that, however, he had not seen the letter addressed to Franklin. Wilkins came to the conclusion that Franklin was simply hired to be his assistant. Franklin had thought that she was an independent researcher. This, combined with the atmosphere of the college and their contrasting personalities, began the first of a strained relationship. Franklin, passionate, swift, decisive. Wilkins, shy, deliberate, and cautious. At King's College, the women were not allowed to eat in the men's lunchroom. Within six months of their working together, Wilkins and Franklin were already having very little to do with each other. On the other hand, at Cambridge, Watson and Crick were already constructing a model of DNA. We were lucky. We just happened to be in the right place at the right Working, working with, with Raymond, Raymond Gosling, Gosling, Franklin's, Franklin's assistant, assistant, she managed, she managed to, to take increasingly, increasingly clear X-ray diffraction photos of DNA. She realized that there were two forms of DNA, dry and wet. Wandering around it was at this time when Wilkins showed photograph 51, without Franklin's permission or knowledge, to Watson and Crick. She realized that the wet form was probably helical in structure, and by 1953, she had concluded that both forms were actually helixes. When I developed the first picture of uh, DNA crystals, I don't think I realized at that time that uh, it was going to be uh, the basic discovery of the uh, century. I think what appealed to me was when I, when it was, I read that there were explanations at a different level which would explain some of these properties. He had the ability to see that probably the most important contribution to science was going to be the discovery of the structure of DNA, as you say, an important molecule. I think if you ask any man in the street who discovered the structure of DNA, they'll reply Watson and Crick. The other two that don't get mentioned much are Wilkins and Franklin, who were in King's. Wilkins and uh, I had used X-ray diffraction to get this beautiful spotty picture of DNA molecule. And this was the thing that I remember most in those days, the feeling of tremendous excitement when I developed the first picture of uh, DNA crystals. Well, I think I was first interested in science when I was a boy. And it's very difficult to remember as far back as that. But as far as I can remember, I was interested in science. And it wasn't something 
that I got from my parents because they didn't know anything about science. But they were very helpful and they gave me a book called The Children's Encyclopedia, which I read avidly. And then I wanted to do experiments, and I sort of blew up things in bottles and tried various other things. So it goes, it goes back, really, I think, to my, the general curiosity I had as a child and my discovery that there was something you might say called science, which you learnt about, about the world. The most exciting thing was seeing the structure. No doubt about it at all.